<laughs> this could take the whole hour. <laughs> Are you sure you want to ask this question? Of course. Um, yeah, it was concluded in my eyes as well, and Lily's eyes. Uh, we wrote it as a very elegant uh, structure, which was dialectical in nature, and it was r resonant with ideas of birth, life, death, and uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and these things which we, we wanted the story to, to be in a triptych for a reason, like many stories are just long, and they split them up, but, the, but Matrix was designed from the beginning like a piece of music or a philosophical argument, and it had a really beautiful elegance to it, and we, we loved it, and, and we thought it, that was it, it was done, and it was, and, you know, every year, Warner Brothers would ask us to make another one, and every year, <laughs> they would drive truckloads of money up to our house and say, you could have this. <laughs> and we said, no, 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 not interested, not interested, not interested. And it never was interesting to me as an idea of trying to continue it. And then something really hard happened in which um, both my parents uh, got ill, or my dad first got ill, and my wife and I went home to take care of them, and, um, and we were really close to them. And, uh, and also a good friend also died in this very short period, a friend of my wife's, and it was just this constant grief, and my, my dad died, then this friend died, then my mom died, and um, I didn't really know how to process that kind of grief. It was really, uh, I hadn't experienced it really that close. My grandma was really hard, and then uh, I wasn't, I knew my dad was getting sick, and I kind of, you know, you know that they're, their lives are going to end, and yet it was still like really hard. And then my brain has always reached into my imagination, and one night I was just crying and I couldn't sleep, and suddenly my brain just exploded this whole story. And I couldn't have my mom and dad, and I couldn't talk to my mom, and yet suddenly I had Neo and Trinity, arguably maybe the two most important characters in my life. And it was immediately comforting to have these two characters alive again. And it's super simple, and you can look at it and say, ah, yeah, okay, these two people die, and okay, bring these two people back to life, and oh, doesn't that feel good? Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> And it's simple, and this is what art does, and this is what stories do, and they comfort us, and they're important. And I was very non-judgmental to mm -hmm. myself. I was like, hey, I know intellectually, oh, so elegant, Matrix, so elegant, I love it. But it was so comforting, and they were back in my life, and, and then I, I asked Lily and if she wanted to do this, and she wanted to process her grief differently. And she was in art school and she was on a different path and she didn't want to go this way to process her grief. But, um, you know, the story evolved and I told my wife the story and she said, oh my God, you have to make it. And I was like, I, 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 Matrix can't go back there. And then I asked my friends and my friends were really the sort of decision-making process that helped me say, okay, yeah, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And this, these people are really the reason we went back and did it again. Yeah, it's uh, Matrix Resurrections. So we have yes. this in the title, but you just explained, <laughs> and Neo and Trinity are dead in a way, and in the end to say it that way. So in the trailer, we saw that they are there. And did the question we? is, the question is maybe strange. Did we? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how far you can go to answer this question because it's always strange to say a word like real in the context of Matrix, of course. 
Ganz genau. <laughs> so, but maybe you can describe a little bit the, the main idea, because time is changing a lot. We are living right now in a very different world than 70 or 20 years ago concerning all these things like fake news, uh, fake reality. So maybe metrics is an answer to that development? You'll see in December. Yes. <laughs> Lana, it's too long. In Germany, the 23rd of December, by the way, is the release date. But you can answer the question, I mean, I think, uh, without reading too much, um, about this changed world and uh, our okay, reception of the world. When Keanu, how we showed the film to Keanu, and he really was blown away by it, and he said something I thought was typically Keanu, where it's incredibly insightful, and, and he's just sort of sitting there, and, and you don't expect some incredible revelation to come out of out of him in that moment but he like casual brilliance just sort of rolls off of Keanu it's, and he was just like sitting there and he goes 20 years ago <laughs> you told this story in which you described the coming 20 years and the problems of the nature of digital virtual life and how it was going to impact us and what it was how we could think about it and gave us a frame to be able to think about it and talk about it and you took the same character and the same stories and the same stuff and somehow you made it about the next 20 years <laughs> <laughs> and he was like how did you do that <laughs> that was a total revelation when I discovered when, when Tom showed me how he did music on Cloud Atlas, and you, it, it's now so obvious. I can't believe that the rest of the in, uh, the movie industry doesn't work this way because when you put music after, then you end up in a difficult situation where you have to use other people's music, and you get, then you get stuck in these strange, repeating hall of mirrors, ruts, and it's kind of inescapable that then it's based on something else. And he, what he does is he creates a new language, just like the script for the movie, and the language is in music. And then you cut your movie to this new language, and it's just, oh, it's transformational. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> has to be stated that I'm not alone. There's someone I do it since 25 yeah. years, with a, yeah. which is um, Johnny Klimek. Yeah. He's my partner in the music. Johnny. Yeah, I always love the way you are treating or working with music in your movies, as you know, uh, Tom. So it will be, I'm sure, a very important part of this new universe. And we just heard you protected them very well, which is unbelievable, by the way, in this business. But on the other hand, you are the creator of um, Matrix. So uh, did you control a bit? And then, no, you can't do that. And I know it better. I did it first. I'm the controller. <laughs> Never? <laughs> no, I, I really I love my friends. This is why I came back to m make another. I wasn't sure I was going to even make another film. I, mm -hmm. Lily was sort of done, and Sensate was something that was so wild and beautiful, and the experience impacted me so much. And I wasn't sure that I could make something better than Sensate. <laughs> it, was, it was so new. It had its own language. It was doing something that I hadn't seen before, and it was something that I wanted when I was a kid to see uh, sexuality and gender and human connectivity without all of the prejudices and biases and that every, everyone, the love and connection and intimacy and sex is available to everyone. And I had never seen that, and it was like, it was, joyful to shoot and make and then I thought okay you know that's it for a while I'm gonna go write about stuff and do other things and Lily was painting she's an amazing painter and she went off to do her thing and and uh, and you know then 
this other thing happened with my parents and then I really needed my friends and my film family and these people who have been so important to me in my life who I can't even imagine who I would be if I hadn't met them. And when we get together, it's, it's, it's like playing and mm -hmm. making stuff up either with Tom or making stuff up with David and Sasha is playing. It's really j joyful. We can do it all day long. It's like when I was a kid, I played D&D &D and I could just do it forever. I could just make stuff up forever. And that's how it is with them. We, we just start saying, and then this, ca and this could happen. And somebody else says, oh my God, and then this could happen. What about if this happened? We never say no. Mm -hmm. We always <laughs> say yes and. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is my board god. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think less about my uh, a relationship to like god likeness than I I prefer thinking about this flow of energy and and when the the something I discovered on I mean just to jump back to Cloud Atlas, which was a really incredible experience for everyone that was involved and the making of the film really changed me as an artist and a big thing not just working with Tom a big thing was also working with uh, John Toll and this DP like he came into my life he's so sweet and was the perfect person for me at this moment in my in my life and in my career and my relationship to my art when I was very young I was afraid of the sun. I was afraid of natural light. I really loved control over light. Mm -hmm. I loved to model things and make things perfect and glints and gleams and this backlight and this side light and, and, and it could stay like that and you would have time for it. And the thing about the sun is that it's just moving and changing and every moment is different. And that was too terrifying to imagine making a film with. And so I wanted to draw s storyboards or I wanted to think of ideas or have ideas come into my mind and then draw a picture and then make that picture well lit in a studio. And this is how my early films were made. And then I met other kinds of artists and um, uh, I met John Toll, and John Toll loves the sun. He loves it. And he, we went out on Cloud Atlas, and we were, we were like, yeah, yeah, we need reality. We, we need reality in this story. This is what David wrote. He, we have to have this relationship to reality. Okay, yeah, we're going to do it, yeah. And we sort of tiptoed out into the world, and John showed me that the same miracle that I love in acting, when you're not, it's not like about controlling, you're just trying to make this, this feel that where people feel comfortable and they want to be open and, and you try to make this for an actor so that they can let their heart just come out and, and when it happens, and, and you can't force it, that ha it just happens sometimes. It's like this perfect, emergence of a moment of something human and you see it and you capture it and you're like oh it's such a gift and that's what John taught me happens with the sun and then if you put them together and you see this quantum magic moment happen where the sun and the light is so beautiful and so perfect and the acting just like emerges it's like it's what became the thing that I loved about filmmaking and that was a big shift from somebody wanting absolute control to somebody who wanted to give up complete and total control and just wait and hope and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think what Tom was saying earlier about the energy that's in the two movies can kind of be summed up in that way, that there's something, you know, very mathematical, <laughs> in the Matrix movies, and it's yeah. beautiful. It's so, and everybody loves how 
perfect. And that's beautiful. Yeah. And there's something that is just miraculous and accidental and yeah. gorgeous that is not, you could never make it with like an exacto knife. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. it had to be just in this quantum magical state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I feel about my relationship to trying to control the story. Mm -hmm. That maybe when I was young, I wanted to control it a little bit more. But now that I'm older and maybe a wiser person, I let the mm -hmm. story control me. Mm -hmm. yeah. It goes much deeper than that. So. Yeah? <laughs> the actual <coughs> Grace Slick performed White Rabbit for this club that was open that Jefferson was basically created to be the house band of this club. And that club was called Matrix. In really? Are we living in a simulation? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious. Unbelievable. I'm I'm really overwhelmed. You, you only found out now, no? Yeah. Really? You, you it's, just a it's a recent discovery. I mean, the club is 1967, okay? Sure. Thanks to Esther. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, just w one question about the special effects, because really I said that Matrix changed the curse of history uh, of science fiction uh, movies. Uh, it was really groundbreaking what you did. Can we expect something like that for the new movie? Things that we <laughs> never saw before, but happened in Matrix, I think. We've got to revolutionize movies <laughs> again. Great. <laughs> I'm so happy.